actually pair right back the logic that companies make profits for the benefits of efficiency, for the benefits of people buying products. The very end point of that kind of logic is that people having access to more products at cheaper prices is a benefit for human welfare. The end point of both these arguments, even one which is entirely economically rational, is about the best way to secure human happiness. The point is, is that in situations where companies have come to dominate uh, small towns as their individual fiefdoms, where they have extracted from the state the benefits of operating like a government but with none of their responsibilities, where they can pick up and leave at a whim in a way which does not benefit that home country, but establishes a system of constant removal of companies who people rely on, that doesn't benefit the countries they ultimately move to at all. Because today, yesterday's South Korea is today's Vietnam. And the system moves on with increasing extractions of benefits from governments in a constant race to the bottom. So, when, our, when the opposition today accepted that there was some level of corporate responsibility, we started off at a good point in this debate, that at some point, the economic system is about creating people's happiness. So the question then becomes, how do we balance those aims of economic efficiency with what are the needs of people living in those countries? No, thank you. So, the key difference, you know, and I'll take you in a moment, the key difference when we're talking about uh, companies in general being obligated to buy people, and these large companies which have taken roles in the state, is they have, they've extracted benefits such as infrastructure. They've created systems where the education of students was geared towards things like technical education in Chicago to work in those manufacturing plants. They have created a system where you wanted to say that it was just about people being paid for their wages. That is not it at all. People invest their lives, their futures, and their dreams, all of their past and previous training, to go in these careers which have been established in these communities. It's not enough to say that, that wage for the hour was good at the time. Yes, I'll take a look. But just to be clear, you're happy with companies laying off workers just before they leave, as long as it's for economically rational arguments like mechanisation. Okay. The key, the, the key difference here, right, is that when companies are laying off people for the purposes of economic mechanisation, that might fall in the balance that we need to address in terms of economic efficiency. But at the point where you are laying off workers because they have simply become too expensive, as in because the country which you've extracted the benefits from has developed to a point where you, where they are no longer useful to you because you have reaped the benefits out of those poor people no. who were too poor to object before. That becomes a moral issue. So when you move, when Hyundai moves out of South Korea, not because of technological innovations, but because they can use people in a more efficient and cheaper way in Vietnam, that is no longer fair. And that is the side of balance that we are willing to acknowledge in this debate. Obviously, we recognise companies have some level, but this is the line we're prepared to draw. So this, uh, this is this is why it is the right thing to do. No, thank you. So then we heard about how this increases the wealth of society, and I've told you how it doesn't benefit Malaysia, or Vietnam, when these countries are used uh, become the next country. But I'm going to move on to this in my yeah. substantive as well. Because the point is, is that they extract these benefits from countries until the point where they develop minimum standards, or where those minimum wages and standards become appropriate, and that is the point where a country leaves. They stymie development. So they stymie the ability of people in Chicago okay. to work themselves out of poverty in manufacturing areas, only to leave at the point where those demands and, 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 uh, and safeguards became too cumbersome. So they worked to the point until no. they have used to serve their needs. But furthermore, you wanted to say that people can just move. Like the point of structural unemployment is that you need to have time to develop these new forms yeah. of industries. And most importantly, you don't lose the second line of industries, which is what really plunges local economies into collapse at the point where people are no longer no. in the mines or no longer working in the factories. Furthermore, what about bankrupt companies? We think this is companies, something companies will account for when they consider their business options, much in the same way as they consider redundancies, for example, and consider the point at which they move. So, at the moment, in terms of market dominance, there is a perverse incentive for companies to continue to move into towns, to dominate their local economies in a way which they can extract all the benefits that they wish out of the local government. So they can get them to build those roads. They can get the government policy through their local members, through the politicians, to be as friendly as possible to them because they are the lifeblood of those towns. This is particularly important as to the point up to which people live. So 
like the benefits that say uh, GM or the benefits that say uh, manufacturing companies in Chicago got until that point because of threats that they would leave was unreasonable uh, in the bargaining power of those particular companies. What you have under this model, ladies and gentlemen, is that now there becomes a new and realistic cost to companies leaving in a way which means that governments do not have to be afraid that if a company leaves, they will be left with several years, of, like decades possibly, of a destroyed city, of people who are unhappy, who are poor, and who are dying. That is kind of, that's kind of the bargaining power these companies really have. And you change that when you have two good years, which allow people the time to get over it, even in particular in countries where social welfare is not, um, not that particular. No, thank you. So, I'm going to move on now to what I talked about before, about stimulating local economies. And the fact is, is that pension systems have typically been created with the kinds of conditions of, say, after six months, uh, after, no. after looking for work for six months, you move on. Uh, then, then you begin to look for, uh, then you get the pension. Or things like, if you are not looking for work, then you, or you're unable to get work, or you're not attending enough job interviews, for example, you're unable to get a pension. It operates on a principle that happens in most towns of companies and businesses closing one by one, of people being able to move from one. This is a kind of structural unemployment which the pension system is not prepared for. It is not prepared for half, like 80% of a town being left unemployed either from first line or second line employment. It was never prepared for that and that is why when companies have developed a new and increasingly novel way of developing their companies, of setting up a town for themselves, that they have a new responsibility which addresses the new needs of the pension system. The government absolutely has the role of doing this because it is about the security, the economic security, and the, impossible, the possible downturns which stymie the progression of these nations. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody today would like an economic system which leads to the maximum welfare of the people. And we are the team that knows how to get it in these circumstances. 